A corpse that wouldn't stay dead. A pistol with a silencer on it and a fortune in a black satchel. Spelled death for the big city boys when they finally got together in lonesome Arizona. Population, 802. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Lonesome Reunion. At 8,000 feet on a clear afternoon, you can see enough Arizona real estate to become an authority on the subject. And as I huddled around a circle of window aboard an American Airlines flagship and gaped like a two weeks with pay vacationer at the carpet of sand, stone, and cactus unrolling a slow inch at a time below, I was impressed. Also, I was thinking about a job which was providing both the switch and scenery and two crisp $100 bills, less the cost of a round-trip ticket from L.A. to the capital city of Phoenix. But then, at the thought of money, I stopped sightseeing and started to think about the work ahead and how easy it had sounded that morning in my office. When Kay Gordon, who was something pretty and blonde, but slightly tarnished for 28, had hired me, all in one breath. Marlowe, my brother Joe Gordon is in a room at the Granada Court Hotel in Phoenix, Arizona. In one hand, he no doubt has his usual smelly cigar. In the other, a small suitcase filled with a mess of papers, all legal, all proper. You fly there, pick up the suitcase, fly back for that $200 cash. Yes or no? Yes, on one condition. The papers, do I get to see them? If I look, I go. All right, you look. Good, I go. Goodbye. That was the way it had started an hour after breakfast. Lunch was alone and at the airport, then it would wait until I'd seen Mr. Joe Gordon, a man who was willing to pay a lot for a little. My plane dropped out of the sky over Phoenix gently at three. At 3.15, I was in room 111 of the Granada Hotel and only 36 smelly inches away from the usual cigar. The man behind it was heavy, pale, and maybe 40. And like his sister, Joe Gordon was overbearing in a hurry. This, Marlowe, is the bag. These, the papers. Stocks, bonds, and mortgages. In themselves, worthless to anyone else. They're non-negotiable. But as information to my competitors, they're priceless. Satisfied? More or less. Meaning what? Exactly what is your line, Mr. Gordon? Oh, I'm a broker. One who bets on long shots. When they come in, I don't like to split with the boys who sit in their hand. Mm. Anything else? Yeah, yeah. I've got some time to kill before I fly back. Do I take the bag now or later? You take the bag now, Mark. Okay. And uh, don't let go of it until you're with my sister in L.A. I'm paying you money to stay away from my enemies, not to shop for trinkets. Oh. Oh, and uh, incidentally, my enemies also play rough. So watch your step and act smart. Real smart. <laughs> I still had two hours to kill when Gordon locked the bag and handed it to me after dropping the key in his pocket. So I decided to take a room there at the Granada Hotel, shave, shower, and stretch. The sleepy clerk in the lobby was not in a hurry, nor did he hear anything I said the first time. So when I finally got to my suite on the second floor, which had as much elbow room as the inside of a lifesaver, 30 of the idle minutes were already gone. I locked and bolted the door, checked all the windows carefully, and then peeled off my shirt broke out my shave master and reached for the knob on the bathroom door. But I never made it. Because as the door swung open, I caught a glimpse of a fist the size of a cantaloupe starting from my jaw. Oh! Now stay right there, Buster. The first time I swing, the second time I shoot. And I do both good. Equal nice, huh? Everything all figured out ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah, but it ain't very hard, Marlowe. Especially when the guy you're after shouts it all to a desk clerk. My error. Yeah. Which leaves just the three of us. Real cozy like. Three. You, me, and 120 grand here in this bag. You're way off pace, brother. This bag's got papers in it, nothing more. They belong to a businessman. <laughs> I said something? Yes, you're very funny. Look, Buster, Joe Gordon's no more a businessman, and his real name is Joe Gordon. Oh. So after I leave, you go back to Sam Dietrich in room 111 and tell him that Marty Stopka says thanks. For what? For the $120,000 I've been waiting two long years for. And also tell him and Gigi Ganther, who might still be around, that Stopka had it all figured, like you say, Marlowe, ahead of time. I don't follow you, bud. You're not supposed to. Just turn around, face the wall, and listen carefully. You tell Sam Dietrich that I knew he'd pull something like this just as soon as he got back into circulation. 
You got that? Yeah, yeah. Word for word, stop Good. Now all you have to do is remember. When Marty Stopka said remember it, he put that cantaloupe with fingers in the small of my back and shoved hard. By the time I got to my feet again, both he and the black bag were gone. That made Joe Gordon or Sam Dietrich my best bet. So I took the stairs to the ground floor fast and raced for the end of the corridor in room 111. But when I threw the unlocked door open, I found something I hadn't counted on. A curtain flapping in the breeze of an open window and nothing more. The desk drawers, the closet, the bureau empty. And on an end table next to the telephone, a bus schedule unmarked. At that, I was beginning to get very mad at a private detective with public patsy named Philip Marlowe. Then the telephone rang, and when I answered it, the operator said that she had a long-distance call for Joe Gordon. I said, thanks, I'd take it. Hello? Sam, this is Kay. I... Marlowe? Yeah, honey, Joe Marlowe is in Brother Gordon, remember? Oh, I can explain all that, Marlowe. Oh, sure, sure, baby, but not now, later. Later, after you've had a chance to think up a few more lies. All right, all right. So I didn't tell you the whole story. What's the difference? Did you get the bag? I did, but I didn't get to keep it very long. Something ugly named Stopka wanted either it or my life, so I made a quick decision. Stopka has the bag. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah, isn't it, though? What? One thing, baby. I'm the decoy with suitcase for some kind of shenanigan that's wrapped around 120 grand, which you and Sam Dietrich have. And there's a trio in the act. Namely, Sam Dietrich, Marty Stopka, and one G.G. Ganther. G.G.? Marlowe, have you seen G.G.? Uh, have you, Marlowe? Maybe yes, maybe no. Now, why don't you come clean? Admit you're happy that Stopka got the suitcase from me while Sam beat it out of an open window. That my part of the job is over with. Come on, baby, talk. All right. I'll make it short and to the point. You got $200 for doing nothing. Out of that, 60 yard went for an airplane ticket. The rest is yours, right? Go on. There's no need to, Marlowe. I'm finished, and so are you. So why don't you just be a good fella and keep the change? So long, sucker. When Kay Gordon hung up, I slammed the phone down, counted ten and twice, and went back to the unhappy business of getting mad at Marlowe. But again, I was interrupted. This time, it was a newspaper, the Phoenix Herald, sticking far enough out of the wastebasket under the telephone to expose the dateline, which made it exactly a week old. I picked it up and saw the two inches of story circled in pencil and slug. Five released from state penitentiary. And, uh, Sam Dietrich, 41 of Los Angeles, who was arrested in Lonesome, Arizona for the armed robbery of a general store in February 1947, also was released today. Now everything was beginning to add, with one high-priced exception. Very few general stores in towns called Lonesome keep 120,000 bucks in the till, even on a busy day. So I headed for the office of the Phoenix Herald and the chance that I could learn something about the cash involved from newspapers that were two years better than one week old. Thirty minutes later, I was in the back shop of the Herald receiving fax willingly supplied by a sandy-haired liner-type operator with a sad face who had never heard the word forget. That's right, mister. It was the Second National Bank of Land Company here in town. Uh, held up at 1.10 p.m. February 7, 1947, by three men who took $120,000 in unmarked cans, 20s, and 50s. One was badly wounded and run in gunfight, but they all got away clean. No arrests, no suspects? Well, other than the usual rigmarole of trying to pin the job on every two-bit stick-up man hauled in the next six months, no. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No, thanks. I don't think... Say, wait a minute. Lonesome, Arizona, that unmarked bus schedule... Tell me, do you happen to know where something called Lonesome is, and if so, how a guy could get there if he doesn't have a car? Sure. It's 87 miles west of here, and the bus will do the trick. But not anymore today. Oh. Uh, the only bus left an hour ago. And now, young fella, you tell me something. What in Sam Hill is Lonesome and a bus departure got to do with a bank robbery was pulled two years ago? Where I stand right now, Dad, I can't say. But when I get to Lonesome, ask me again. I may have the answer for you. <laughs> I was 30 minutes renting a car and an hour and 30 minutes getting to Lonesome. Population 802. I drove without seeing anything that could possibly be mistaken for Sam Dietrich. And I was about to turn back when I saw something that brought my right foot down hard on the brake. It was a brand new green Nash standing outside a motel. California license plate. I got out of my car and got a look at the registration card wrapped around the steering wheel. It said Catherine E. Gordon. The motel only had three cabins that showed any light. The first belonged to the manager and the second to Kay. Close to an open window, I saw the man Kay was talking to. 
He was an ex-convict and part-time broker named Sam Dietrich. All right, all right. So Marlo knows he was set up for Marty Stavka. Who cares? We're here, and so far Stavka isn't. And even when he does show, we'll be gone with the real black bag safe in our hands. Yes, but what about Gigi, Sam? I told you Marlo mentioned his name. And I told you to forget it. Marlo must have been swinging in the dark. Gigi can't be alive, Kay. He was badly hurt when Stavka and I got clear of the bank. But why wasn't his body found? I don't know, Kay. I've told you that a thousand times. Ah, now, now, look, honey, why don't you just relax and think of us a little, huh? <laughs> Gigi's dead, baby. There's only you and me. Sam, you know how I feel about that. I love Gigi. The only reason I'm helping you, I don't want anything to do with this money. I only want to know for sure about Gigi. Okay, okay. Hey, did you get a line on Leland Mills, the name that was on that mailbox two years ago? Uh, yes, yes, yes. He owns the place and lives there alone. Uh -huh. A once upon a time small ranch on the last block in town, coming apart at the scenes. Mm -hmm. What about Mills himself? He's an old duffer, maybe 50. Lives close to the fireside, day in and day out. <laughs> Good. That means I can handle him without any trouble. And now, look, baby, it's uh, seven now. At nine, this town will be fast asleep, and at ten, I'll take care of everything. So uh, why don't you just curl up there on the couch and think about nice things? Huh? Oh, nice things like what? Well, like the money I hid at Leland Mills' place five hours after the boys and I took that bank. <laughs> the $120,000 that's soon going to be back here with me where it belongs. Dad exit my cue and left because one Leland Mills was a man to be forewarned while 10 o'clock was still three hours away. I was ten minutes finding his place, which was on the edge of town, and another two locating the doorbell, which was the kind you pull to start a bunch of jingling inside. It was three pulls later before the door creaked slowly open, and what had to be Leland Mills stood in front of me. He was shaggy, gray hair curling on the sides of his neck, a face with a thousand crisscross wrinkles and dirty old clothes. Everything I'd expected with one exception. <laughs> Gripped firmly in both hands and pointed directly at my head was a long, long rifle. Who are you? Uh, Mr. Mills? Maybe. Well, I'm a private detective named Philip Marlowe, also someone who knows that there's $120,000 in cash hidden here on your grounds. $120,000? To the penny, yes. Two years ago, Mr. Mills of Phoenix Bank was robbed by three toughs named Dietrich Stopka and G.G. Ganther. G.G.? Hmm, that's a queer name. It's not important, old man, but this is. Now, somehow or other, that stolen money was hidden here, in or around your place. Hmm. And tonight, one of those men is due back to collect. That, of course, means trouble for you. You think we should call the law? No, no, not yet. If we play it smart, we can get the dough spotted first and at least one of the three. All right. Mr. Marlowe, if you're sure of what you're saying, I only hope you are. Oh, I'm sorry about this gun here. I don't like poachers on my land. Yeah, we all have our pet peeves. Now, Mr. Mills, I want you to sit tight till I get back. And no matter what happens, don't open that door for anyone. Have you got that? Mm-hmm. Yep. Where are you going? To town. To check on the only two things that can possibly give us any unexpected trouble. One, a nasty man named Marty Stopka, and the other, a guy I've never even seen. The elusive Mr. G.G. Ganther. I left Leland Mills standing in the doorway and worried my way back to town. If Stopka and G.G. Ganther had no more trouble getting lonesome than I did... A reunion about as quiet as a truckload of hot dynamite was due to take place any minute. I passed the motel where Kay and Dietrich had holed up and saw that her car had been moved into the stall between cabins and draped with a blanket to hide its California place. So they were thinking along the same line that I was. At the hub of town, I parked and started to case the lively spots on Main Street, which took me all of ten minutes at a slow walk. But a short side-of-the-mouth conversation with a couple of resident sports revealed that the local underground stemmed from the Red Dog Cafe, a warped wood two-story wiki up on the one side street in town. It was operated by a hard-bitten blonde, 160 pounds of western motif, complete with Stetson, red flannel shirt, hickok belt, blue jeans, and the name, Flora. She sat at a table at the back of the bar room, lending a cynical ear to nobody else but my old pal, Stopka. I walked up behind him, and when he turned around, I hung one on him. A good one! Hey! <laughs> Love me, jackass! What do you think you're doing? Sorry, Flora, nothing personal. <laughs> now, that's enough! Now, stop it, you hear me? No rough hustling in my joint. Come on, handsome, I mean you. Me? Why, Flora, how can you say that? 
just came in to ask my old pal here some questions, that's all. Here we go, pal. Come on, sit up in that chair. Okay, okay, let me along. See, Flora? It's the only way Stopka here knows how to start a conversation. Bring him another beer, will you? His old one got spilled. Sure, bright boy. When he's either you do tourists leave your beefs outside next time. Now, look, Stopka, I want to know what happened two years ago on that highway out here. You guys split up, didn't you? You better talk, Stopka. All right, we split up. The heat was on bad, and Gigi was half dead already from a cop slug in his back. Dietrich had all the dough, right? What do you think? I left him and Gigi off outside of town. I took the car to try to suck the cops away from him. We were supposed to meet later. But you kept going to save your own hide, didn't you? Certainly. It's going to pay off, sucker. You'll see. Uh-huh. Since the money was never found, you figured Dietrich hid it around here, and he's coming back to dig it up. Is that it? Keep guessing, Shamus. Maybe we ought to loosen your jaw again. Stop that. That's all. You too. Now try to loosen your hands up and by Sadie. I'll plug you. Well, a real genuine 44. What museum just swiped that from, Flora? Never mind. Got a legal right to defend the peace and quiet of my joint, and after 22 years in this dodge, I know how to do it. Now, I asked you nice once, now I'm telling you. You, yeah. get out. That back door there. Hey, sure, I'll go, sister. Thanks for nothing. Hey, wait a minute, Flora. Don't let that lug get away. Shut up. Now, you sit down right there and count up to 50. Then you leave by the front, quietly. Okay, you win. One, two, three... Flora, look out. He's back. What? What? Sorry, Eddie. Uh, you buzzard bait. I'll leave this cannon on the back steps. So long, Flora. I beat it out the back door and into an alleyway between the shacks. Stopka was still in sight but walking fast. And when I took after him, he saw me and started to run. There was a hard, flat sound like someone striking wet sand with a hammer. <laughs> Stopka faltered and lurched up on his toes as if he'd suddenly changed his mind about running. The same instant on a wall, even with him, I saw the shadow of a man holding a pistol with a long, awkward barrel. The hard, flat sound came again. Stopka curled up on himself and fell. And the shadow slid off the wall and disappeared. I ran for the wounded man, but by the time I got to him, there was no trace of the gunman. I rolled Stopka over. He was hit hard, slipping away fast. Silence. Gigi always used a silence. Punk Gigi. He's dead, huh? You wise guys never know when to quit, do you? You're in real trouble now, handsome. Hey, wait a minute. I didn't do this. Come, I couldn't hear the shots, a silencer. Yeah, that's right. Trademark of a guy named Gigi Ganther. All I saw of him was his shadow on that wall there. Say, what kind of law have you got in this town, Flora? None. Except the highway patrol. They stop in every night. Okay, call him. Get him over here. This guy's Marty Stopka, wanted for a bank job, nearly two years old. No kidding. Who are you, his trainer? I'm a private detective who's got no business here, except I don't like to be pushed around. Now, listen, do you know Leland Mills' place at the edge of town? Sure. Well, you get the cops out to Mills' place by 10.30, do you understand? That's where the big attraction's going to be, if I can keep Gigi in his silence of interfering again. Now, let me down, beautiful. No, I won't let you down, handsome. For a city boy, you're all right. <laughs> I stuck to a back road and drove with my lights out until I was a good, safe distance beyond Leland Mills Ranch. Then I hid the car in a dry gully and walked back. The house was dark and still. I thought once of what might have happened to Mills if Gigi had gotten there ahead of me. I kept in the shadows and worked my way across the yard to the back door. Who's there? Marlo. Open up. I was beginning to worry. It's pretty near 10 o'clock. Yeah, I know, I know. Seen anybody so far? No. Nope, not a soul. I've been watching close, too. Did you find them men, that G.G., that Stopka? Yeah. Stopka's dead and his killer's you to show up here any time now. Oh. We're going to have our hands full, I... Now, wait a minute, is that a car? Sure sounds like one. Yep. There, yeah, you can just make it out. Turned in down by the covert and stopped. Yeah. I think a man got out. Yeah, yeah, there he goes, across the field there behind your shed. It's Dietrich. I'm going out now, Mills. You stay here. No, I'm going too. But that fellow's heading right for my water tank. All right, he's heading for your water tank. Don't get excited. You'll tip our mitt. Ooh. I get this, Mills. You've got to stay here and watch for Gigi. He's bound to show up, and when he does, you better have that rifle of yours handy, because he's a killer. Do you understand? Yep. Sure, I understand. Don't worry, Marlowe. I'll keep my eyes open. Don't you worry about a thing. eased 
out of the door and started across the yard, I, I knew I was getting myself out on a nice, long limb. Leland Mills was about as reliable as William Tell with their hiccups, and the apple was on my head. It was too late to back up, so I skirted the barn, stayed below the crest of a low rise, and moved toward the elevated water tank until I heard a shovel biting dirt. I got a comfortable grip on my gun and headed up over the rise to where I could see. Yeah, it was Dietrich, all right. He was bent over under the tank and working on a hole as if his life depended on it. He didn't even look up until I was almost on top of him. Well, who's, who's there? Who is it? Me, Mr. Gordon. Marlowe. Marlowe? How did you get here? Wasn't easy, Sammy boy. But I had to come and apologize for losing your precious bag full of waste paper. You sure picked a dangerous time to show, sucker. You were fired once. Too bad you can't take a hint. Uh-huh. And being tagged as a patsy is lousy for my business, Dietrich. You should have thought of that. So just leave your hands on that shovel handle, Sam, and keep on digging. Maybe I'll let you take a peek at that 120 grand before I turn you both over to the police. Go on, dig! No! no not so fast, Marlowe. Mills, I told you to stay in the... Hey. Hey, that's quite a pistol. Don't move. Neither one of you. I'll kill you if you move. You, Marlowe, drop your gun. Drop it. <laughs> well, this is where it's been all the time. A hundred and twenty thousand dollars. I've looked everywhere. Every day for two whole years, but I, I never thought of looking here under the water tank. You mean you knew where the money was all the time? You lie, you lie. I'm the only one that knew that. Oh, no. One night, two years ago, I heard a noise in my barn. It was a man groaning. I looked in and I saw him. He was wounded. And I saw you when you come back from burying the money. I overheard the whole thing. You wouldn't tell them where you'd hidden it. You said you'd never tell anybody. But I was sure I could find it. And I looked everywhere except... Yeah, my... Mills, everywhere except here, under the water tank, where you buried Gigi's body after you killed him. And with his own gun at that. Oh, no, I didn't kill him. Dietrich here did. I only buried him so nobody would find out that him and Dietrich had stopped at my place. I almost went crazy looking for that money, but now I know where it is, and I'm going to have it. Well, you fool, you don't think I'd come out here with nothing but a shovel, do you? A friend of mine is right behind you with a gun in her hand. So come on, drop yours, Rube. <laughs> come on, come on, drop it. All right. Okay. That's an old trick, Dietrich. <laughs> Let him have it. Shoot, Kay, shoot! <laughs> Didn't work, did it? I knew I'd have to kill you sometime anyway if you ever came back, so... You ah! fool, Mills. I suppose that makes me next. Yep, Mr. Marlowe. I think it does. Think again, Mr. Mills. What? Who's that? Kay! You, you were there all the time, and Dietrich wasn't bluffing. Oh, I love you, Kay, baby, and I'll take the gun now, Mills. Ah! Turn it loose. Oh, Come on, I'll break your arm. Ah! There. That's better. I'll look after this gun until the police get here. And uh, look after this one, too, Marlowe. I haven't got the courage to use it anyway. I couldn't even shoot Sam Dietrich with it. He's the one I wanted to use it on. Why? Because of Gigi? Yeah, because he killed Gigi and lied to me. I promised to help Dietrich only because I figured all three of them would show up here, Sam Stopka and, and Gigi. That way I hoped I'd find him again. You were right, baby. All three of them did show up. Only this time they finished their job. For good. It was 10.30 on the nose when we got back to the house And the highway patrol had just pulled up So the question and answer period started And by the time it was over All the field work finished up Four hours plus had gone by It took some fast conversation A lot of promises to stay handy But finally, Kay was left with me after all, her only real mistake had been falling in love with the wrong kind of a guy. When the last patrol car drove away, the desert was suddenly very still. The stars were small and sharp in the clear sky. The air was cold. Maybe that was why Kay Gordon trembled. Marlo, I... I'm sorry about all this. I got you into it, remember? Mm-hmm. You also got me out of it, Kay. Well, I can forget about Gigi, now that I know for sure what happened. <laughs> and all because of a jerk named Leland Mills. No, Mills was a desperate guy, Kay. After he buried Gigi, he just about went nuts trying to find the money. When he finally realized Dietrich was the only one who could lead him to it, he shot Stopkin and would have killed anybody else. 
keep him from interfering with Dietrich until he uncovered the hiding place. You know, in a way, Marlo, it was a horrible trick of fate. They both picked the same place to bury things. Not really. Mills and Dietrich had the same jobs to do, under the same conditions. They each had to bury something in a hurry and in the dark. So both of them picked a spot where the ground was soft and one that was clearly marked at the same time, under the water tank. Yeah. And it... Mallow, I'm kind of scared. I don't like this place. This spooky little town. It's the end of nowhere. Yeah. I wouldn't be caught dead here myself. Let's go, baby. I walked Kay to a car. Started her safely on her way. So long, sucker. She waved once, then drove down the road and out of sight without looking back. Soon even the sound of the motor was gone. A long night and a strange reunion. And now two lonely lights were the only sign of life in lonesome Arizona. I stood on the empty highway for a few minutes and listened to the immense quiet of the desert. Then I went back to my rented car and headed for Phoenix and a plane for home. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore, and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Joan Banks, Edgar Barrier, Virginia Gregg, Jeff Chandler, Bill Boucher, and Jack Crucian. The special music is by Richard Orant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It was a weird racket that mushroomed in a world of gaudy canvas. And the man with purple hair, the inquisitive midget, and the lady with strong hands each played a part. But all that was only a sideshow when death got into the act. Across the nation, communities and the parents of Boy Scouts are observing Boy Scout Week, agreeing with the boys themselves that adventure, that's scouting. Now stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS network stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.